year was 1926. The city, Washington, D.C., was a historian and a prolific writer by the name of Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who pioneered Negro History Week. We now know it as Black History Month. Uh, Dr. Woodson was uh, the second black man to earn a Ph.D. from Harvard University. W.E.D. Du Bois was the first. But it was said that that Dr. Woodson could be seen uh, actually not too far from here in the Shaw neighborhood, 1538 9th Street Northwest, in his three-story row home, uh, collecting black history, writing proficiently, hour after hour, collecting all of this information. And Dr. Woodson committed himself to this work because he believed that the narratives uh, and the stories of black people and other minorities in this country was virtually being lost, ignored, or misrepresented. And he hoped that uh, by elevating these narratives and these stories that he could somehow Uh, help black and white people uh, come together. He hoped that he could help uh, race relations. Now, it's interesting that this uh, was launched by Dr. Woodson in 1926 because this was also the beginning of what's known as the Great Migration in our history. So that would have been from 1920 to 1970, and that's when you had black people from the South moving north, Midwest, uh, and to the West. And it's almost as if uh, Dr. Woodson was peeking into the future of our America, seeing the landscape of our America changing, seeing how uh, cultures were going to cross and intersect. And him elevating these narratives, he hoped, would help with that. You would have uh, the proximity of difference during those times coming closer and closer together and being less and less restricted. During this time, you had black people who were systematically excluded in a lot of ways in society now uh, fervently pursuing uh, inclusion and basic civil rights. This was no doubt a major sociological shift uh, in our culture and a pivotal moment in American history. It was a time of discomfort at best, and it was a time of violence at worst. And some fought still to uh, pursue integration, even though they knew that tensions were high and they knew uh, what was at stake. They said, we're all God's children, and even if you didn't believe in God, you at least said, well, we're all human, so we should be able to get along with one another. But then you had those who said, no, actually, I think our differences are better segregated. They're they're better separate from each other. And and maybe we should only cross uh, paths when it's absolutely necessary. And then you had those who are maybe indifferent and weren't bothered one way or the other. They just wanted to make sure that they weren't inconvenienced or they at least somehow benefited from whatever the system was. I don't want to belabor the point, but I think all of us, Uh, could agree that uh, we are still trying to figure out how to live with difference. We're still trying to figure out how to connect with people different than us. Now, you know, sometimes it's it's not all that serious. It's a matter of annoyance more than anything. You know, maybe you're in the office and you've got that coworker who uh, has decided to leave their broccoli salad in the refrigerator for three weeks. Not cool, not cool. Or, or, or maybe they, they, they thought that you were invited to their conference call or the entire office for that matter because they're talking so loud. Then there are other matters that maybe you live with. Uh, Pastor Joel and Nina talked about in the first week, they talked about marriage and difference in marriage. And, and, and my wife and I have been married for 15 years and we still have some of those similar uh, challenges where I'm a morning person and she's a night person and we're still trying to figure out when does the light actually go off at night? Because I'm, I'm trying to get to sleep usually earlier than her. Then, hey, maybe, you know, there, there are other things that, that 
kind of bother you a little bit, but maybe they're not a huge deal. You know, like you've got that friend who roots for the wrong team. You know, I won't, I won't call the team. Or, or maybe, for me personally, you have dear brothers that you love, you know. Uh, I, won't, I won't say any names like, like Pastor Marion or, or my brother Joshua Dubois who somehow or another joined the wrong fraternity. It's a, it's a side joke between us. But, 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 but as we look at where we are in our culture, particularly here in, in the nation's capital, I mean, we can see that there are clear lines of difference. There, there are clear lines that, that we have drawn, and we are clearly on certain sides of certain issues, and, and they're, they're, they're very personal to us. Maybe we're on the side of, of Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter or pro-choice or pro-life or, or same-sex marriage or should women preach or should they not? And the list goes on and on and on. So as we are in this third week of our series, Better Together, I was given a lot of thought about what was stirring in me and what I wanted to share, and, and, and the, one of the thoughts that I had was all of these things that I mentioned, I mean, they're not new. We've had cultural clashes since the beginning of time. We've had tensions uh, throughout history that have been uh, chronicled, and, and so we, we understand that these things have continued to be, but I also want to elevate that we've even had these tensions in the church. You know, the early church was trying to figure out, okay, so how do we live among people who are different than us, come from different cultures, backgrounds, uh, who, who pursue life very differently? And that was both an internal clash within the church, and then there was an external clash outside of the church with the culture. See, the early church was primarily made up of Jews. Uh, the people who uh, were following Jesus were, were, were said to be of the way. They were the early Christians. And this guy, Jesus, comes on the scene and completely disrupts the religious order. He completely disrupts the systems and the way things are, are set up. And it was an absolute problem. Because Jesus came on the scene and brought this gospel that he said, listen, I am about everybody. I'm for everybody. And it was a gospel of redemption and reconciliation for everybody, not just Jews who were the chosen people of God, but also the Gentiles who were not Jewish. And it was a a big problem, a a, a big tension that was caused as a result. So so, so we see in uh, the book of Acts, Uh, the beginning of the formation of the church. And if you have a Bible, I want you to meet me in Acts chapter 15 in in just a second. But the early church, as a result of these clashes, had to answer the Gentile question. So what do we do about these people who are not Jews, but they love Jesus and they want to follow him? I mean, it seems kind of crazy, you know, to think about it now in this context, but But this was a a, a serious thing because culturally uh, there were certain lines that were drawn and there were just certain things that you didn't do and certain people didn't mix. And certainly anyone who was not Jewish would be following a Jewish rabbi without being Jewish. Is there a way for us to be in relationship with people who are not Jews Um, and still also be in relationship with Jesus at the same time. In other words, are our differences better together? So the leaders of the church got together, the OGs and, you know, the leaders and whatever you want to call them, they, 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 they got together and we zoom in on Acts chapter 15 uh, to, to eavesdrop on some of the conversation and discourse that was happening at the Jerusalem Council. So if you uh, can, would you stand as we honor the reading of God's word in Acts 15, starting at verse 1. We'll go verse 1 and 2, and then we'll hop over to verse 5. And go through verse 12. We've got the words on the screen so we won't leave you hanging. Let's go. 
certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate within them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some of other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Skip over to verse 5. It says, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do we try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we or our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity. Open up our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to be able to receive what you are saying to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're in this series called Better Together. And so, hey, maybe I I thought I would just tag uh, this message this weekend, uh, Better Together Despite Our Differences. Now, We just read uh, some of the discourse that happened in in, uh, Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council. And and I won't really get into, uh, actually, I won't get into the details at all in terms of the conclusion, in terms of what they decided to do with the Gentiles. But but I'll just tell you that um, they decided, the bottom line was, okay, we're not going to ask Gentiles to be circumcised, which was the custom, but we will ask them to abstain from three things, meat sacrifice to idols, from blood and all sexual immorality. So, so that, that became the, the bottom line and the result of, of the council. But, but I actually want to zoom in on Peter, Paul, and Barnabas and, and what they shared with the council and, and the significance of what they shared. And so I actually want to back up a little bit and give us a little bit more context because we see that Peter, Paul, and Barnabas spoke so eloquently uh, in favor of the Gentiles, but I want us to understand why and how they were able to do so. So, so let me just give you just, just a little bit of context. If you back up a little bit in the same book of Acts, you see that Paul and Barnabas, uh, Paul had previously uh, been converted. He actually used to uh, persecute Jews who followed Jesus, and then he has a radical conversion, and now he's... he's uh, uh, um, He's pursuing people, and he's telling them about Jesus, and, and he, he's had this radical transformation, and then he gets Barnabas with him, and so they're going all over the place telling people about Jesus. So they go to Cyprus, uh, then they go to uh, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Those would have been in Asia Minor, um, uh, modern-day Turkey, and they're engaging with Jews in the synagogues until the Jews put them out. Um, And then uh, they were engaging with uh, mainly Gentiles, people who were not Jews, and the Gentiles loved them. They they received them, and uh, Paul and Barnabas spent a lot of time teaching with them, hanging with them, doing life with them, eating with them, because, you know, you don't, you don't, back in the, you weren't taking flights, you know, like you go and stay with people for uh, days, weeks, and sometimes months at a time. So so they, they, they spent a significant amount of time with these Gentiles. Then you had a significant story that happened in Acts chapter 10 with Peter. So this guy named Cornelius, uh, who was a Gentile, and he was a centurion, meaning he was a part of the Roman army. And uh, if you were Jewish, you didn't necessarily love the Roman army because they, they, represented, uh, they, they were occupying the territory. Uh, but Cornelius 
is praying, and he's a faithful man, and he has a, a, a reputation of being faithful, and he's praying. Uh, he's in a city 40 miles away from Peter, but God reveals to him, he says, go find this man, Peter. Uh, he's staying with a man named Simon and Joppa, so send some men to go get him. So, so they go get Peter. Peter, at the same time, is praying. So while Peter is praying, he has a vision, and God is showing him all of these meats and telling him to eat them, but, but these meats would have been prohibited as a Jew. So he responds to the vision saying, no, God, I would not do that. I've never eaten anything unclean. And God says to him, Peter, do not call anything impure that I have made clean. And by the way, there's going to be a knock at the door. A guy named Cornelius is looking for you. He sends some men, go with them. It's all good. And boom, a knock comes at the door <laughs> like that. I mean, don't you wish God would answer our prayers like that sometimes? <laughs> but, but just like that, you know, he hears the knock. Peter knows what he's supposed to do. He goes with these men, and they show up at Cornelius' house. And when they get there, there's basically a party waiting for Peter. And so Peter engages with Cornelius, and Cornelius is so excited for him to be there. The people are excited, and they begin this discourse. And the first thing that Peter says is, now you know it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with a Gentile, even visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not discriminate. God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure that he has made clean. Peter has a personal revelation in prayer. And then he has a, 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 a major experience at Cornelius' house. It's, it's a personal experience. And while he is in conversation with them, a Holy Spirit moment happens. They have a Holy Spirit encounter. And this is a critical sign because Peter understood what Acts 1.8 said, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's what Jesus said. So he knew what that looked like. He understood what that was like, and he had experienced it. So to see it amongst Gentiles was a major sign for him. And this was his response. He says, I now realize that God does not show favoritism. It was a complete game changer. It was a game changer because he also knows now that being an ally and an advocate for Gentiles has serious implications. It has serious implications for his reputation. It has serious uh, implications for his life. It has serious implications for his safety. What else is there? This is a big deal. As a matter of fact, two chapters later in Acts 12, it says that King Herod seized Peter and threw him in jail because he knew that it would please the Jews who were upset that Peter has now crossed a line that you do not cross. Then in Acts 14, it says that Paul is stoned and dragged out of the city and left for dead because of his preaching to the Gentiles and trying to convert them and, and, and being with them. But I love how it says that uh, he was left for dead. The disciples go to him, try to get him up. He stands to his feet and he goes back into the city. Now, if ever there was a reason to go home, that was one of them. <laughs> but, but it shows you how personal it had become to Paul. It shows you that it, it meant something to him and that he was ultimately willing to die for it. He, here, is, here is the crux of this message this weekend and, and, and just a couple more minutes and I'm, and I'm actually going to be done. But I need to say this. I'm not going to give you anything prescriptive this weekend. Because my prayer is that we would have the same kind of Holy Spirit moments that Paul and Barnabas and Peter had, that the Spirit would guide us in the direction that we need to go. Sometimes we're looking for a formula when we need to be plugged into the Holy Spirit and what he has for us. So, so don't be disappointed because I'm not going to give you uh, an ABC one, two, three, but I'm going to leave you with a little something. 
Here is ultimately what I want you to know. Paul, Barnabas, and Peter's experiences tell me that it was almost impossible for them to respond to the council the way they responded. It was almost impossible for them to be an ally and an advocate for people who were different than them without being in relationship with them or having significant experiences with them. Now, listen, I'm not saying you can't be an advocate, but I'm saying that it changes the game when you have experience and relationship, right? Because the moment they start stoning me, I'm thinking about that. <laughs> but, but you see the significance of the interaction and how they saw God move. I know that, that we're, we're all really smart and, and the research shows in this area that we got a lot of, you know, educated people, a lot of PhDs in this area. But, 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 but listen, I, I, I want you to know if you don't know, and I want to remind you if you do, that our decisions in life are ultimately a byproduct of our education, our experiences, and our exposure. So, if in Myers-Briggs, you are an S, all right, that means you like concrete facts and data. If you are an N, that means intuition, you know, you, you, you're a little bit more theoretical and, and, and you know, you, you, you move on intuitions and hunches, but it doesn't matter. It, all of it is still connected to our education, our experiences, and our exposures. So Paul, Barnabas, and Peter, they all know what Jesus said. They know. They have the head knowledge. They know it. They know what he said in Acts 1-8. That the word's going to go to Jerusalem, then it's going to go to all these other places, which what, what the people that live there are not Jewish. Like, like theoretically, they know this. And they had knowledge of it, but it didn't become real to them until they had experiences, until they had relationships. And their input at the Jerusalem Council was a reflection of that experience. They literally saw God at work in people different than them. Now, here's the thing. Here's why I think we need to know this and why this is important. The reason this is so critical for us to understand is that, one, I mean, we're we're all created in the image of God. I I, I think we know that. Uh, We call it the Imago Dei. And I love the way Nina uh, said it in in week one of the series. She said, uh, the gift in difference is that it leads to things that are beautiful. It leads to. Doesn't necessarily mean it's that way in the beginning, but but it leads to. But the second thing that we need to understand is the gospel is both a picture and a blueprint of how we are to live reconciled to God and one another. It's the blueprint. So that means that Christ's followers should be leading the way in how to do this and and how to build relationships with one another. And this is so critical. Paul spent so much time in the rest of the gospels writing letters to the churches, letting them know this is how You need to do this. That lets you know how critical it is. It's a major theme in the entire New Testament. So, all right, I hear what you're saying, Pastor Joshua. It's good. I feel you. You're right on. So so, so what do I do? Well, that's a prescriptive question. But I'm going to give you something. It's simple. We, if we're Christ followers, if we're interested, if we're exploring, like to be a Christ follower, to be a Christian is to do what Jesus did. I know it sounds simple, but listen, Peter stepped across the threshold of Cornelius's house because he saw what Jesus did. Let me just remind you that Jesus is a threshold crosser, a barrier crosser. This is what he does. They were always asking, why is he hanging with those people? Why is he eating with them? Doesn't he know that person's a sinner? Doesn't he know that this person uh, has done this? Doesn't he know this person's reputation? But it reminds me of of just several instances throughout Scripture. One of some of my favorites, uh, uh, Zacchaeus. 
Who is a tax collector, man? You just didn't like tax collectors back then. You might not like tax collectors now, but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 they, but, but they were hated because they stole from people and they lied and they, they charged whatever they wanted to and, and people did not like them. But Zacchaeus was pursuing Jesus and Jesus saw him and he turned. He said, Zacchaeus, salvation has come to your house today. Jesus basically invited himself to the enemy's house and said, we're going to eat. And people had a problem with it. They didn't understand it. Another story, Luke 5, one of my favorites. And it's a very, very simple miracle. But, but there's a leper who falls on his knees and he says, Jesus, are you willing to heal me? And he has leprosy. And, and you have to understand the language that he's using. He said, are you willing? Because he's an outcast. He knows he's not even supposed to be talking to people like that. He knows he's only supposed to be hanging with lepers. He knows that he's an outcast. And Jesus not only says, I'm willing, he touches him. And the man is healed. He can heal him without touching him. But Jesus understood the power of touch. And he wasn't afraid. He crossed barriers. Then there's a Samaritan woman. She got two strikes against her in the culture. She's a woman and she's Samaritan. Because nobody would, you, 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 you didn't hang with the Samaritans and, and, and you weren't supposed to engage, uh, uh, men and women weren't supposed to engage that way. Jesus not only engages her, but then he defends her. And Pastor Mark talked about it last week. Yeah, anybody going to throw that stone? Let me see you. Where you at? Jesus, superior cross. I could just continue to go on and on and on. See, here's the thing, though. When I say we, we need to do what Jesus did, the problem with that is, Doing what Jesus did ain't comfortable. And that's what we pursue. We pursue comfort. We build monuments to comfort. We celebrate comfort. You have arrived if you can, if you can show a certain level of comfort. So it's counter. What Jesus is saying and, and following Jesus is counter to what we celebrate. And it's a problem. And it's a struggle, and it's hard, and it doesn't make sense. And you get tired of explaining certain things. You don't want to explain. Let me just give you a practical step, and let me give you a practical warning. The practical step is this. I think that we can work harder to genuinely seek out relationship with difference, not information gathering. That's not the same thing. Genuine relationship, genuine experiences with people who are different than us. That means spending time. That means making a commitment, not, not, not fact gathering, so that we can say we know a little bit. The practical warning is, as you begin that process, don't get too excited in the beginning because you never arrive. It's the beginning of a journey. Don't start getting all weird, man. You read a couple of books and, you know, you think you know a little something, you show the word with a dashiki on. You know, don't, <laughs> don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. All right, let, let, me, let, me, let me keep moving. This, this, this is why we, 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 need, we need to do it. See, the implications of not doing what Jesus did is then we are reflecting a false gospel. We are reflecting a gospel that is just comfortable to what we like. We're, we're, we're perpetuating a gospel for just the friends and the crew and the issues that, that we like or that are important to us. But here's what you need to understand, and I, I stole this from my brother Thabiti, who passes down the road here. He, he, he says, theological agreement is not necessary for social unity. And that's where I think we get tripped up a little bit as Christians because, we, you know, we're trying to size each other up on certain issues, but, but, hey, at the end of the day, we might not agree on some of those things, but it's not necessary for social unity. And we, we can reflect that better than anybody else as Christ followers. Let me give you this, and I'm done. The Pharisees at the Jerusalem Council said, if the Gentiles want to be with us, they got to be circumcised. In other words, they got to acquiesce. You want to be with us? You want to worship like us? You want to follow Jesus like us? Well, you got to do what we do. You got to be circumcised. End of story. 
Here's the challenge to that. The way of Jesus laid out for us is not for us to make others assimilate to our ways, but it is for us to imitate his way. I'm going to say that again. The way of Jesus laid out for us is not for us to make others assimilate to our ways because we would do that to make us comfortable. We, we know that routine. We know that process. We know what that feels like. But it's not that. It's to imitate his way, which is harder and messier and unpredictable and unsafe. But that's what Jesus did. So you can't say you following him and you ain't down with that. So maybe we need a reevaluation here. Because it's not easy. It requires sacrifice, humility, perseverance, long-suffering, always love, sometimes joy, <laughs> fruits of the Spirit. That's why they're the fruits of the Spirit. But here's the thing. If there is anyone who can model what it means to be better together, despite differences, it should be Jesus' followers. And then here's the, here's the last thing. Paul says he has given us, us meaning the Jesus' followers, the ministry of reconciliation. He's given it to us. So that says to me, I need to be on my job. I ain't got to love it all the time. It might not be, you know, it, there's going to be some ups because you said where the spirit of the Lord is and we carry the spirit of the Lord, there's liberty, there's freedom. So we carry that with us. So, so there will be some fruits of that, but it won't always be easy or comfortable. But it's our ministry. It belongs to us because Jesus gave it to us and he modeled it for us. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for how you've called us to embrace differences. You've called us to live in a way that's sometimes uncomfortable, sometimes not safe, sometimes frustrating. but you model for us how to do it. And then on top of that, you went before us and guaranteed us victory. So that means no matter what we're feeling, what we're facing, what the score is, any of those things, we're guaranteed victory if we submit ourselves to you. So, so help us to remove the distractions. And God, I pray that you would, you would allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us where we need to start. Where do we need to start? What step do we need to take? And then help us to continue to take steps. Even when it gets frustrating or we're not seeing the progress that we would like. Because it is a journey. But you said you will be on the journey with us. You said you've given us your Holy Spirit, to lead us and guide us in all truth. And that's what we need. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.